And when we talk about mobile phones and emerging markets, what, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about the phone like I have, you know, my BlackBerry with the 3G and 4G or not? It's a really quickly moving um, target right now. The, the default is the, the, the sort of simple $10, $20 phone, maybe even less if they bought it used, and it's not data enabled. That's still the, what most people have, and certainly the, what uh, people who are more resource constrained have or share. Most adults live near a signal. Most can get access by sharing to a phone, but that will be a very basic phone. But most of the phones that are being built now and sold, even in shipped to Africa, have data in some way or the other. Um, that doesn't mean that they're a full smartphone yet, but the data channel is available. Um, and those are hard to build for, but they're coming along. And then at the top, in every country in the world, um, there are people who use smartphones, and a lot of BlackBerry, for example, is, is quite popular in, in Indonesia, you know, for example, with the BBN messaging system they have. Um, it's, not just a, it's not just a tool for folks here. So, but do you assume that five or six years from now, the phones that people have in emerging markets will be m much more sophisticated? Is that? That is a, it's a difficult question, and it's one we need to really focus on when we're deciding what to deploy. The choices that we make about platforms are so sort of contextually dependent on, on which, which communities you want to work with. If you're saying, you know, bottom billion, poorest of the poor sort of thing, those, the, the phones that Nokia built a few years ago to last three weeks on a charge and not get all dusty and all that kind of stuff, they're still going to be around in 20 years and they may be in the hands of the people you most want to employ. In the meantime, there'll be all this conversation about people having smartphones that are going to coexist. Hmm. Jacob, could you talk a little bit about how your company came to be and how you got funding and what the challenges have been in building something that stretches some of the much stressorous terrain in the world? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, my own background is in uh, helping manage economic growth and development projects for contractors to the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA. I'm originally from Canada. Um, I initially began to think a lot more about using technology to address problems of labor market disconnects. Uh, when I first went to Palestine, uh, about seven years ago, I would say we were doing an analysis for USAID on uh, young people, their needs, their aspirations, uh, what types of resources would be required to really get young people participating meaningfully in society. And we were going around and conducting all of these focus groups, and a really uh, consistent thread was we need better information about opportunities that are out there. We're, we're kind of flying blind here. We're graduating from school or more frequently we're not going to school. We're getting out into the labor market. We understand this concept abstractly of work but we don't really know what it means and where it can be found. And so you know, what can you do as practitioners, as agencies like the bank for example to help us? Uh, and so tangent to that, and this was even in 2005, uh, one thing we really were noticing was the uh, advent and the proliferation of mobile phones. And they were, as Jonathan was saying, the very basic Nokia or other branded feature phones uh, that are simple. Uh, $10 a handset or less. They can send text messages. Their probably primary uh, quality or attribute is the fact they have a really powerful flashlight that you can shine if you have no power where you're living. Um, so those were still prevalent and fairly ubiquitous uh, even at that time. And so that idea generated from there. We thought, look, there's a problem in terms of labor market information flows uh, and, uh, and this could be a potential solution. Now, in 2005, uh, we, uh, I would say, got relatively little attention attracted to this. Uh, mobile phone use here in, in North America was still very much on the grow. It's not to say nobody had them, uh, but it was not perceived as a tool, as a, a sort of be-all and end-all uh, tool. And so it was quite slow for us at first to get the traction, both among funding community uh, and among uh, users of the service in general, to say, you know what, this isn't just something that you text LOL to your friend on. This is actually a way that you can get a job. Um, and so. We did a lot of public awareness raising and sensitization. We picked uh, target employers, your Coca-Colas, your beverage manufacturers, your national electrical utilities, the companies that are present in every emerging market, uh, pitching aggressively to them and saying, look, this is actually a way forward. The usage rates are there. Uh, the uptake levels are there. The interest is there from young people who make up the bulk of the population and the bulk of the labor market in your emerging market. So it would be in your interest to use this technology. And slowly, 
by virtue of these repeated interactions and, and presentations, uh, we were able to attract uh, attention, funding. Uh, the bank uh, was actually uh, instrumental in helping us bring to market uh, the initial service in, in Palestine. Uh, we took part in a pilot that was offering support to higher education institutions. Uh, and uh, the bank was providing resources to those institutions to look at different ways to fill the gap in employment. Uh, and this was, the technology was one of the supports that was offered. Uh, in addition to a range of training uh, and the establishment of some on-campus career centers. And so the bank actually helped us uh, get a start hmm. in many ways. Hmm. Gary, I want to ask you the same question, but first I want to understand, do I have to have a PC in my house to be a worker in your outfit, or how does this work? Well, um, yes and no. You, ha you have to have a PC to work. So you either have one in your house or you have one at your local coffee shop that you can rent or whatever, but you do need a PC in order to work. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you're dealing with a different level of consumer than... And Jacob or not necessarily? Um, no, I think Jacob is essentially a different business model. It's about permanent on-premise employee right. employment. So it's region in region, right? right? So it's local. You're looking to hire somebody on-premise. We're taking the trends of globalization, the economy, and the Internet, and we're saying, wait a second, it's far, uh, it, it's, it's, there's much more disruption to be had here in the world of work. I see. And it's saying it doesn't matter where you're born, you should have access to any job that you're qualified for regardless of where that job exists. So we're leveraging these three mega trends to say, uh, you know, forget about your birthplace, what, what can you do? And similarly for the clients, for the people that need work done, they should be able to get the work done from wherever they are in the world. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, one of our contractors um, is in Bangladesh, he uh, was looking for a job for six months. He was out with friends. They said, have you heard about Odesk? He came back from the bar. I don't know how he had money to drink because he had no job. But anyway, he, he comes back. He posts his, he creates a free online profile at midnight. By the time he woke up the next morning, he had a job. Now, that job was $2 an hour. And this is a skilled programmer in Bangladesh. Uh, he took the job at $2 an hour. Within weeks, he was making $4 an hour. Within a couple of months, $6 an hour. He's now $25 an hour programming iPhone apps from his home in Bangladesh. He spoke to our company. There was barely a dry eye in the house. That's why we're in business. Uh, people should be able to work. They should have the freedom to work on the jobs of their choosing, uh, whenever they want, however they want, with the skills that they have at the rate of their choosing, and clients similarly should be able to grow their businesses and, and get competitive uh, based on accessing skills that they don't have in their local geography as well. And so you started your career, or a good part of it, at IBM. This is a very different scale and different. How did, how did this company get going, and how did you end up there? Um, yeah, so I, was, uh, I started at a very small technology company called Pure Software. Pure went through, went public in 1995. A series of mergers and acquisitions ultimately became a part of IBM. As employee number 30 at Pure, I missed my uh, ability to have impact on where a company was going, growth and development, uh, financial reward, all of the things that come with a startup. So I decided to jump back into the startup world. Odes came about. Uh, based on our two co-founders, uh, who are Greek. Odisea Satsalos was living in Silicon Valley. Our other co-founder, uh, Stratis Karamalakis, was living in Athens. And they wanted to work together. But the CEO of uh, the company where Odysseus worked, the previous company, didn't want that. He said, how, do we, how are we going to communicate with him? How are we going to collaborate? How do we know that he's actually working? How are we going to get work done? And Odysseus started building this platform to facilitate remote work. And essentially, the communication, the collaboration, the real-time visibility. Uh, specifically, what our platform does is it takes a screenshot of my desktop six times an hour at random intervals to enable the client to course correct me in real time. Think of it as managing by walking around despite the fact I'm remote. And as long as I log my time in that system, I get guaranteed payment. An hour worked is an hour paid guarantee. Odesk guarantees it, even if we don't collect it from the... Uh, from the employer. So I, uh, I found out about the company through a VC. Uh, they asked me to join. That was, uh, that was over six years ago. And we've been slowly building the network since up to more than 300,000 clients and 1.6 million contractors and about $30 million a month of work going through our platform in the month of April. So I get if I am um, I'm, I'm like the example you gave in Bangladesh, I'm clearly better off $25 a day than when I was earning nothing. Uh, $25 an hour. $25 an hour than during nothing. But 
it does kind of conjure up the idea that uh, I can have my company in Silicon Valley and I can have all the workers in the world competing for my work. Uh, is it, uh, it seems to me it gives me a lot of bargaining power. Then that the the risk is that you know, the people compete the wages down to nothing. Is that? Not, um, am I seeing something wrong here? Yeah, it's not quite quite the race to the bottom that you're you're envisioning. I think with fixed price work. So build me this widget. And uh, how much is it going to cost to build this widget if I perfectly spec it? That's a little bit of a race to the bottom world. In time-based work by the hour, uh, you could argue that why isn't the world like that? Why not even on-premise, right? If there's jobs in Silicon Valley, why aren't more people going there and competing for, for the job? So our clients have told us that they care more about quality than price. Well, I think they often come for the price. Uh, you often get what you pay for, and some of our clients say, hey, I'm, I'm happy to pay uh, whatever the prevailing wage is. So yes, it is competitive, um, especially based on certain uh, types of work. Another example, in the Philippines, the average wage for a nurse is a dollar an hour. So a nurse in the Philippines, highly educated, uh, very smart, great English skills, incredibly hardworking, makes $8 a day. On ODES, the average daily wage, the average hourly wage is about five bucks. Right, so, and uh, there's a lot of educated, unemployed nurses in the Philippines because the U.S. cut off visas. We no longer import nurses. And, and so they're looking for work. So we have a lot of them on our platform. Has nothing to do with nursing, but they're smart, they're educated, they're incredibly hardworking, and they're thrilled to make five times the daily wage of, of a nurse. Now these are a lot of jobs that um, uh, U.S. workers may not want to do. In Silicon Valley, people don't want to get out of bed for $5 an hour. Jonathan, you've worked, as I understand it, with uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and even self-employed people. What, what does this technology do for them? Uh,